Good evening. I'm very excited to have the lovely JD Kirk back with me. Hi, JD. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, no problem at all. I am JD Kirk, uh, otherwise known as Barry Hutchison, which is my real name. I don't know what the JD stands for in JD Kirk because I still haven't figured that out um, since last time we spoke. I write uh, Scottish crime fiction primarily. So the first book was a Litter of Bones, um, the first DCI Jack Logan novel, and then that spun off into the Robert Hood and Thriller series, and North Wind is the first in that series. Book one came out in October in this series, and book two came out at some point after that. Um, last November, when did that come out? February? Something like that. Quite recently, then, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I think it was February, and then the next uh, Logan book, next DCI Logan book, comes out in nine days. It comes out on the tenth of May, um, which I think is nine days away. And then the third Hoon um, is in July, and that was going to be the final one, but I've I've changed my mind. There's going to be another one. There's going to be a fourth after that. I think so. Um. As you were one of my very first interviews, I have no idea what I asked you last time, so I apologise in advance if I ask you the same questions. That's all right, because I've forgotten as well, so it's fine. We're both okay. I have got new questions that are different to the normal, so... Cool. Yeah, it should be fun. Um, did you always know that you wanted to write? Uh, yes. Well, I mean, not always, but when I, was, uh, I was nine when I knew that I wanted to be an author. Um, there was a couple of reasons for it. One, we'd just done a project on Roald Dahl, who you and I were speaking about just before we started recording. Um, then a project in class on Roald Dahl. And that was the first time that I knew that author was like a job that you could do. Prior to that, I'd written stories you know, for my own amusement. And then I found out that you could you could write stories in return for money. And I thought, well, that sounds right up my street. Um, but the thing that really kind of convinced me, um, we had a little... Uh, the, the public library was attached to my school, just this small public library. It was only kind of open, you know, a few hours a week, really. Um, and there was a new librarian came to it, and my teacher took me to the, or took the class to the library. And I didn't read books at that point. I read comics pretty much exclusively. I still read loads of comics. Um, but we had to talk, tell the librarian what sort of books we like to read. And my teacher kind of tried to embarrass me, I think, by, by, making me say that I liked reading comics and didn't like reading books. And the librarian went, oh, wait there a minute. And she went next door uh, to the little storeroom and came back with this big stack of comics. And she said, like, we'll read them. And I, I just came back to the library every day and I read those comics. And then she started introducing kind of books into it as well. So she would see that I was reading a comic about, you know, robots or something. And she would start going, oh, here's a book about robots. And I'd read that. Um, and, and eventually I got to the stage when I was just going in and asking for books. I said, I want a book about monsters. And she would find me a book about monsters. Or, But I remember going in and asking for a book about ninjas. You know, the Japanese kind of secret sneaking about warrior type people, assassins. Um, and she said, I haven't got a book about ninjas. And I was devastated. I thought, like, the library has failed me. Um, and then she says, but wait there a minute. And she went through the back again. And she came back with a notebook and a pen or pencil and said, go and write a story about ninjas. So I wrote this terrible story um, and she took it and she read it. And then she wrote my name on the spine of it and she put it on the shelf in the library. I mean, I assume she binned it shortly afterwards, but, but she put it on there. But then when she was on there, you know that moment in films when you get like the, the clouds part and that sort of shaft of light comes down and it's like, oh, it was like that, this sort of like realisation that this is, I want this. I want my, my book to be in with all these other books on, on bookshelves. So, um, so yeah, I've wanted to be a writer since I was nine, is the answer to that question, which is, is the shorter <laughs> answer. Um, if you were to be picked up and transported as a character into any of your books, which book would you choose? Um... It would have to, like, if I was being transported in as a character, it would have to be into the Space Team series, which is the, um, the first books for grown-ups that I wrote, because um, I wrote children's books for uh, 10, 10, 11, 12 years, thereabouts. Um, and loads of them would be really fun to go into, but uh, my first kind of books for adults was a comedy science fiction series called Space Team. And it was complete escapism on my part. I came up with the idea when my mum was really ill. She was, she was dying of cancer at that point. I you know this interview suddenly got very bleak, um, but I was sitting kind of at the bedside and just um, 
she was kind of unconscious for loads of you know big spells of it and i would just daydream and i would kind of go you know looking at it was dark it was night and you know look up at the stars and um and i'd kind of imagine what would could be going on out there and what sort of adventures you could have out there so it was pure escapism um and the books are i'd love to be part of that that crew on the the in the space team books i think and just have the the wacky adventures that i could get up to that sounds like fun actually i have a cushion actually the little reaches and he's over there i have a green green you can just see an eye poking up over my head there that's that's splurt um one of the the characters from from space team i have wondered about that since we started talking I must yeah there we go <laughs> just that, that creepy eye sticking out over the yeah. top yes yeah i actually just did a a, a kind of combined my love of, of sci-fi and that and and comics and i just did a, a kickstarter for a space team comic and we're looking to get two thousand pounds to cover printing and it made eighteen and a half thousand pounds or something so um so the the space team fans came out in force to support the comics so it was really nice wow that's amazing yeah it was good it was really really nice yeah that's incredible okay so if you were to pick any of your characters to take out for a meal who would you choose and what would you ask them oh god i think i'd love to go i'd love to take hoon out from from the um from these books he's like a really it'd just be interesting to see him let loose because he's he's a really sort of aggressive um really foul-mouthed um kind of creatively offensive character so i'd love to just um to take him out into somewhere really posh somewhere really uh really sort of expensive posh silver service sort of restaurant um and just just watch him just not even ask him anything just just or just go what do you think of this place and then sit back and um and just listen to him ranting for three hours before you know upending the table and walking away uh so yeah i think i'd, I'd love to take him out for dinner and just see see what he did which of your characters has given you most trouble most trouble um I don't know. See, like, part of me wants to say Hoon because he is, um, he's a he's a problematic character. But I think, uh, in the Space Team books, Cal Carver is the main character in the Space Team books, um, and he never did. Like, I would I would plan out those stories, and he never did what what I expected him to do in the story. So I would I would go, okay, he's going to go from point A to point B, and somewhere along the way he would decide that wasn't happening and it would the whole story would go off at a completely different tangent which is which is kind of nerve-wracking as a writer especially you're writing to a deadline and you go i need to have this finished by then and i had the plan all figured out and now that plan makes no sense whatsoever um so so he was quite problematic in that he would just derail the story and it would become something else entirely along the way um so probably carl carver and space team um, I totally forgot what I was going to ask you then. I'll go blank for a second. <laughs> I go blank um, ten times a day. Oh yeah. In fact, I think I think blank is probably my default default state for most of the day. To be honest, uh, with occasional moments of action. <laughs> there must be more than occasional. You know, you're pretty prolific in most stuff, so I think you're fine. Yeah. Well, weirdly, weirdly, I don't like when I'm writing, it's almost like my fingers do the writing. I kind of feel like I'm channeling something because I like I type and I'm like my brain. I read it after it's written down and I kind of go, oh, yeah, that, that's good. You know, or that, that I like that. that does, but it's almost like this bit's happening before this bit is. It's a, it's a strange, it's a strange setup. I'm not complaining, you know what I mean? But it's, it's uh, I don't quite understand. So I've never been able to, a lot of people dictate, you know, they will, they will, they will kind of speak their book out loud. And I kind of just go, uh, 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 and nothing comes out because I can't think of what to say. But I sit at a keyboard and, and the words just come out on their own. So uh, it's a strange, strange thing. I can yeah. also type, I can also type out a book and have a conversation at the same time, yeah. which makes me think that, that, I mean, the conversation makes no sense, but <laughs> and I'm typing <laughs> gibberish, but but no, I can type and, you know, my wife will come in and say, do I have from the shops? And I'll say, you know, yeah, I'll have a Twix so i can and i can so i can type and i can think about twixes at the same time which is a rare skill <laughs> interesting <laughs> yes. 
Um, I remember my question now. Um, which of your characters has changed the most from book one to the latest book in your series, any of your series? Uh, that that has to be Hoon, I think, because this, so the Hoon, Hoon in, this guy, in this book, uh, he was, without any kind of spoilers, he appears in the second um, DCI Logan book, so he's not in this one, he's in the one after it, and he is, um, he's Logan's boss, basically. And I wrote him to be a sort of two-dimensional, just he's an angry boss character. Like, you know when, you know when Cagney and Lacey, there was the, the, the little boss, the chief, that would always kind of shout at them. And, and it's quite that, that sort of, um, that stereotype of, you know, I'm going to take your badge, you know, it's like, give me 24 hours, chief, and I'll bring this guy. So it was that sort of, just, he was going to be a thorn on the side of, of the other characters, really. And he's really aggressive, and he's, he swears a lot, and he's he's clearly unhinged. You know, like the... And the first, the first few books it appears in was just me going, how, how unhinged can I make this man? And I thought no one, like, everyone's going to look at this and go, ha ha, that's a funny over the top, you know, um, stereotype type cat of a, of, a, of a police chief sort of thing. Um, and the number of people that emailed in go, I've worked with a guy like that. You know, people that who, who, who are in the police and go, I know who you based that on. And it was like, no, I didn't base it on. If anyone treats you like that, you know, go to some sort of tribunal because that, that that shouldn't be allowed. Um, he's awful. But then um, I started getting loads of emails about him. People saying, oh, I really love him. You know, it's really, I love that he's so in your face and over the top and he'll just say whatever's on his mind and there's no. <laughs> and I kind of started thinking, could I write a whole book about this guy who is a monster? Like he's like in those first few books, he's, he has zero kind of redeemable qualities whatsoever. Apart from, you know, people found him funny because he was so offensive. So I thought, can I make him that people will will root for him? You know, how can I can I actually make him a three dimensional character that that remains true to the character? Was like he's still horrible. He's still a horrible human being, but that people will cheer for him. You know, people will want him to to win. Um, and that's what I I tried doing with this this the first book, Northwind. Um, and it, it seemed to work. People seemed to people would write in saying, you know, I hated the character and now I absolutely now he's my favourite character. Or um and by the by the third book, and it, it doesn't happen often, it's happened about three times while writing ever, I think. In the third book, in the second last chapter, I uh, burst into tears when I was writing it. So he's kind of gone from being this um angry shouty two-dimensional kind of joke character to literally um reducing me to tears in that second last chapter wow <laughs> i shall have to catch up <laughs> so yes yeah, so i think he's changed he's changed the most um do you hide secret jokes or messages in your books or easter eggs um yeah loads of there's loads tons of easter eggs in my books tons and tons and tons of them so there's running jokes in in the space team series um and there's there's reference to space team in the the dci logan books quite a lot of them have have little hints about space team and um i think one of them there's a, a cushion similar to this and there's someone's wearing a t-shirt that's got the splurt character on it and things and so there's little lots of little nods to other stuff that i've done Throughout, and then even in the kids' books, I did a, a I did a book years ago called the Shark Headed Bear Thing, which is a monster with the head of a shark, body of a bear, tail of a bunny, because that's terrifying as well. Um, and then I did another book, which is a completely different series um, called the Spectre Collectors, which is about this kind of mystical ghost hunting organization. Um, and one of the things they they catch is a shark headed bear thing. So I've always done it. I've always done little references and even in in some of the logan books and what are the latest logan book or the one before that one of the most recent logan books there's a reference to um dci harry grimm which david j gatward writes so i've been friends with dave for years uh, so i mentioned him and there's a reference to alex smith's paper girls book and one of them and stuff as well so there's lots of little kind of crossover things like that that i throw in so it's generally just for my own amusement but it's always nice when people pick up on it and you know it's a uh, it's like a little sort of um, like a little secret group or something. People go, oh, I know what that is. I know that. that I, I get that reference. I get that joke or whatever. Um, so I, I like throwing in stuff like that. Yeah. Do, do most people get them or, or are there ones you put in you're disappointed that people miss? Um, I don't know. There's, there's, I think there's always people get some of them. 
I think there's all, you know, I don't think there's anything I'm put in that, that nobody's got. Um, but some that maybe only, you know, a handful of people will go, oh, yeah, I understood that. You know, I mean, I do. Uh, so so it is it's nice when they do. But it's never, you know, it's never put in the, to the kind of detriment of the, you know, the story. It's not like if you don't get it, it's going to make any difference whatsoever to the story. It's just a little sort of nod um, to things I've either done in the past or, or whatever. It's... Um, uh, or it's a, it's a, you know, kind of subtle sort of running joke that's... So, like, in, in the Logan series, like, in one book, he gets a dog. Um, and I know the readers were really excited that he got a dog and they want him to, to keep the dog. And, and so, basically, in every book, he attempts to get rid of the dog. Like, <laughs> because they've always said, you know, make him keep the dog. But in every book, he tries to get rid of the dog in some way, you know. And it's so... <laughs> So it's just that sort of, and, and everyone knows he's never getting rid of this dog. I mean, he's never, he's stuck with this dog now. But it is just that little kind of running gag of he's once again trying to offload the dog onto someone uh, and they're not interested. <laughs> oh, bless. that's great. Do you get lots of sweary messages and emails in? <laughs> or are they lessons off now and they wouldn't know what you're up to? Um, yeah, the, well, yeah, they're usually the the pretty um because people are reading it at different speeds, you know what I mean? So people are, are just they've just met the dog in some books, so they're going like, you know what, we love this dog, keep this dog. Uh, the worst thing I ever did um is in the in the first book in the Litter of Bones, there's the implication that a cat is harmed. Um and you know, the book is about a child murderer. Um and uh, and another child has been has been abducted and um and people were not remotely bothered at, at, at the thought of child murder that imply a cat is harmed and you will literally receive death threats for it so it was uh, uh yeah that was a lesson learned was don't harm the cat or definitely not the dog the poor dog cat I think I think if I did harm Taggart the dog in in the books I think I would be lynched <laughs> yeah oh yeah i have no problem sending swearing messages to authors even though yeah. i mean tony forder sort of hinted that he'd killed off his main character and he'd kept so quiet about whether he's continuing the series and i was reading it into the early hours and he'd put this scene in and i was like you absolute and then but you carried yeah. on reading it, it was fine but so you bastard yeah. <laughs> so yeah. how could you do that yeah i do that quite a lot so it's 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 quite fun to do though you know you can show yeah, I think early on, one of the books, there's a scene where there's a character that, that you can, it's implied this character is dead. And then, it, you know, because it, it goes to a graveside and it cuts to the funeral almost sort of thing. It's a thing they do in films quite a lot. Cuts to the funeral and that, and then you reveal that it's someone else's funeral and the character's alive and do it. So I've done that before. Um, and yeah. it's it's just a fun little, just it kind of just tweaks that suspense yeah. a little bit longer. You go, it's just that moment of <gasps> he hasn't killed them off, and then the relief that, that they have, and it's all. I love all that reading. You know, when I'm reading, I love that that sort of complete roller coaster of emotion. It's not like, you know, I just want exciting things. Like uh, you become invested in the characters, and you, and you know, you don't want them to to suffer, but but at the same time you do because that's what makes the book exciting. You know, you want you want them to suffer, but you want them to come out of it at the other side. It's. Uh, it's a, it's a strange thing, fiction, you know, to go for us to get so invested in these people and then to want them harmed, <laughs> but not really. It's a, it's, a, it's a strange relationship we have with characters in fiction. You know, I don't want to see them, I don't want to see them sitting down having a nice time. I want to see them being absolutely put through living hell <laughs> because I love them so much. You know, it, it's a weird, weird thing. Um, You must have killed your characters in some horrendous ways, but if you were a fictional killer in a book, how would you kill your victims? Um, how would I kill my victims? I don't know. I think um, this question kind of reminds me of that whole thing with O.J. Simpson. Remember O.J. Simpson was was it was his wife, wasn't it, that he was accused of, of killing her, his wife and her partner. And then I think he did, a, he did a non-fiction book. He was kind of cleared of it in criminal court, but civil court, he was found guilty of it. And then he had a book that was going to be coming out. It was basically, I didn't kill my wife, but if I did kill my wife, this is how I would have done it. And it was like, a, it was supposed to be like a fictionalised blow-by-blow account of how he would have murdered his wife. He definitely didn't, he insists, but if he had, this is how... And then I think the book got axed at the last minute sort of thing, but it was such a weird, weird thing. Um, but anyway, how would I kill him? I don't know. Um, I can't... I, it's... Like, I never... Like, 
I I spend a lot of my days thinking what's an interesting way to to discover a body. You know what I mean, but I don't I don't really think about how I would kill people myself. Not in any ways that I feel comfortable discussing. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I don't know what I'd do. I think in in one of one of the first books that I ever wrote, one of the first sort of attempts at an adult book. Um, there's a there's a crime scene. It's not in in the DCI Logan series. It's, there's a crime scene, and there's two white sheets on the ground, um, and it's a, a victim's been cut in half, and the the you know, the detective says you know what's top and what's bottom points to the sheets. This is what's top and what's bottom, and the other detective says no no, left half right half, and they've been cut in half like down the middle, then they've been cut kind of like vertically. And um, I think that's, you know, that'd be an interesting thing to find, wouldn't it? That'd be an interesting. So if I, <laughs> if I had to kill someone, I'd probably split them vertically from one end to the other. <laughs> if you're going to force my hand on what I'm going to, there's probably that. Someone asked me the question and I said I'd stab someone a hundred times. And apparently that means that, you know, that there's some deep you're, meaning. You're demented. It was quite like... <laughs> I mean, that means you're <laughs> yeah. absolutely demented, yeah. yeah. Yeah, all I'm doing is is cleaving them in two <laughs> through the skull down to the groin. But you are, I mean, I'm just, that's one blow in my in my imagination. I don't know how I don't know what kind of weapon I need to fashion to to cleave someone in two neatly in two. But but that's just one. You're you're going at them again and again. I mean, after three or four, I think the the, the you know jobs are good and you're done. I don't know yeah. if you need the other you need the other ninety six or ninety seven. But you know, yeah. each to each to their own. Who am I to judge? Yeah, exactly. It was the first thing that came to my mind as well. I don't even know where that came yeah, from. Yeah, because like that. See, yeah. I had to think about it. I had to think, <laughs> and it's my job. It's my job to make this up. You go, how do you kill someone? I stab them one hundred times. Like to have that, the, you know, the tip of your tongue like that. That's that's concerning. Yeah, apparently so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm looking to therapy. I think. Yeah, it's probably 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 worth worth thinking about. Yeah. Um, so if you were to be fictionally murdered, who would you want to solve your case? Uh, who would want to solve my case? I'd want, um, oh God, I'd want a team up. I'd want, I'd want Logan and all his team and Hoon to come together. And then maybe Space Team as well. Because <laughs> my murder is going to be uh, extraterrestrial in nature. So I want, <laughs> I want them all to, all to come together to solve my murder. Um, because to them I am I'm like a, a godlike figure. <laughs> so so they're gonna they're gonna unite to try and to try and solve who murdered their god. Um which feels like quite a good book actually. I, I could but I'd read that. I'm well you're the author. <laughs> I'm not gonna write it, it's not like far too much like hard work, but um <laughs> I'd read it, you know. So um yeah, I'd want I'd want the full the full team up. And then bring in, bring in some of the, you know, I say I wrote for the Beano, bring in Dennis the Menace, well. bring in all of them, just bring every character I've ever written, just all tramped all over the crime scene. Yeah, it'll get solved quickly, I guess, or possibly, or... Probably maybe. never, probably, yeah, probably, probably, probably yeah. never get solved, yeah, probably just, <laughs> uh, just remain a cold case forever. Which would be a shame, you know, but... Yeah. We'd still want you, we'd be fine. Your, your books would live on forever, you'd be what fine. I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd be functionally immortal, even if I'd been stabbed a hundred times. Um yeah. I'd be I'd be functionally immortal in some way or another. Exactly, yeah, you're fine. Don't worry about it, it's cool. You know, don't yeah. lose any sleep paper or anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah I'll, I'll try not to, but it's <laughs> slightly concerned, but I'll try not to. <laughs> I mean, luckily for us, we're like total opposite ends of the country, so you're perfectly yeah. safe from me. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, the, the I, travel, I, the hours. No, it's not worth it. I'm not. I'm not worth it. Believe me. Yeah, yeah I'm not. Just, I'm not worth all that. I'm not worth a twelve-hour train journey. You know, and I've got to go to work tomorrow, and the mess, yeah. and the. You're never, you're never going to make it back in time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, never so. Make it. And I'm, I mean, I'm halfway up a mountain. The effort of getting here is is not. Believe me. So yeah, you're fine. Good, good. That's reassuring. <laughs> I thought it might be. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if you were to have any famous author read your book, who would you choose? Um, I don't. I don't really know who who I would pick to read my books. Um, well, with the space team, I would love Douglas Adams to read to read because I love Douglas Adams. You know, I I, I I've had Neil Neil Gaiman's read some of my children's books. I read one of my children's books anyway, and he gave me <laughs> um, 
he gave me a quote for um there's a book called the 13th horseman and it's a boy who finds three of the horsemen in the apocalypse living in his garden shed um he finds uh, war famine and pestilence and you discover that um death has quit death has been bored because they've, they've created at the beginning of time and their job is to ride across the sky at the end of time and they've got nothing whatsoever to do in between times so they just sit playing like tiddlywinks and stuff in this shed basically um, waiting for the call for the end of the world and death has had enough and he's quit um, and you find out death death the leader the really stressful positions so of death keeps quitting so there's so this boy gets recruited to be the new death and he turns out to be um the tenth death and i think there's a famine or pestilence lists off what happened to the other deaths and i think it's um quit you know quit mad suicide mad quit goldfish suicide mad or something and we find that the goldfish was an admin error and the goldfish should never have been death in the first place <laughs> and was rubbish riding the horse um but he becomes he gets recruited to be one of the horsemen of the apocalypse and um and neil gaiman read that and he tweeted about it he tweeted a picture of it in his bedside table and stuff which was really nice and then he said um he would give us a quote for it and i thought well, great a big you know a quote from neil gaiman that's going to be great and his quote was i really liked it <laughs> it's like oh thanks you really dug deep for that one gaiman you really dug it to get like, what what would be what could capture this yeah i really liked it um so on the front of that book it says i really liked it neil gaiman it's short to the point you know it, it is you know, it's, it's, it does, you know it's a it's a positive endorsement it's not as not as glowing as i might have hoped it's like it's all right you know, gaming, you know what i mean it's um so but yeah the, the sci-fi stuff um yeah douglas adams would like to to read it i think some so the crime stuff i think a lot of probably some crime authors have already read it and stuff so um yeah i don't know but yeah i would have loved um I love Douglas Adams to read the sci-fi stuff, even as if he could just so he could just tell me it was rubbish. You know, I'd quite like him to go. I actually did because because I have a thing. I'm not very good at, at um at like promoting my books and this. I, like I, I hate going read this book. It's good because I, I you know I kind of go read this book. It's, you know you might like it but you might not because it might not be a, you know it might not be a cup of tea, and that's fine. So I'm I'm not good at doing that sort of thing. But I got an advert done for the Space Team books. And the advert was, it was this kind of a very American man, this big, bald American man goes on kind of like, hey, if you're looking for a book that's like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but not as good, try Space Team. Um, so I actually, like, I literally had to kind of, you know, sell myself short to, in the advert because I was like, I can't say it's as good as that because it's not, but it's, you know, it's similar. So that was the, so yeah, Douglas Adams. I think that answers the question. I'll be honest, halfway through that answer, I forgot what the question was. And I thought if I just keep talking long enough, it'll make sense. Yeah, probably. Um, probably does. Probably does. Yeah, Who knows what the maybe. question Who was. Who knows? Yeah, it was yeah, a while move, ago. Well, let's just move on. Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> uh, but what was your favourite first as an author? My favourite first? Yeah. Like the first, yeah. first, first of anything? Yeah. Um, you you must have had stuff you were looking forward to the first time you held your book and the first five-star review and that's yeah. which is your favourite. Yeah, um, I think the first time, I think when my first kids book came out, it was called, um, it's called Mr. Mumbles. Um, it's the first book in a series called Invisible Fiends. And it's um, about a boy whose imaginary friend from when he's four and um, comes back when he's 12 and tries to kill him in a variety of horrible ways. Um, and I walked into my local, we didn't have a bookshop in, in Fort William at that point, but at W.H. Smith that had a little book section. And I walked into WH Smith like like a week before the book was due out. And I saw it facing out. As soon as I walked in, it was facing out on the shelf. And it was like a like a complete mind-blowing sort of moment of like, oh, well, this is this. And it was it took me, it did absolutely took me back to to standing in that library when I was kind of nine and going, like seeing that thing. It was that exact same feeling. So that that I think was my my yeah, my favorite first because it was that. This, oh, this is a real thing now. This actually exists because I hadn't even got my copies through the post at that point. I think mine came out two days later, so it was like, oh, this. And for a moment, I panicked because I thought, oh no, there's a book that looks just like mine. This is, is going to be no. Uh, and then I realised it was mine. Um, so, so, but that I think that moment of like 
oh, if this is real then, um, that was nice. Yeah, blah. Um, if you're able to travel to any period of time, either forwards or backwards, where would you go? Um, I think I'm like I'm really interested in thinking if, like really far forward in the future. Like I think I would go like a million years into the future and just see what's going on. I think going into the past, like I'm, like, I'm worried because then I'm start overanalyzing it. Going if I mess it up here. You know, I, I might come back and, you know, we've all got tails or something. I don't want to be responsible for that. And I feel that's the kind of thing that I would accidentally do. <laughs> you know, I'd accidentally go back in time and cross breeders with, you know, lizards or something. Um, so I think for just for my own peace of mind, I'll go to the future. And I think, like, I'm kind of torn. I kind of think, well, you know, I could just go like, you know, 30 years in the future and see how my children turned out. But then I kind of go, nah, I'll just I'll leave them to sort of their own stuff. I don't, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to go, oh, they're, they're, they're a nightmare, they're disasters. They're all in jail. Or, you know. <laughs> so maybe like, like a million years in the future, and like what, you know, what have we become? You know, how do we, what are we like? Are we just like a gas? You know, I don't know what we, I don't know why we'd just be a gas, but have we, you know, what have we evolved into? What's the, what's the world like in a million years? Does it exist? You know, are we out flying through space? what we're doing. So, so, so way beyond kind of comprehension of what it could be like, you know, so that's where I would go. And then probably immediately be, be captured and put in a zoo um, <laughs> and experimented upon, but, um, but it'd be fun while it lasted. Yeah. We so just have a quick 24 hour visit, have a look around and see what's going on. And then yeah, you'd magically disappear and net back. Yeah. So, yeah. And I could write, I could write some amazing <laughs> sci-fi. Um, so that's what probably what I do. Go and just take a notebook and just write it down and go, yeah, I'm doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and then a million, in a million years time, people look back and go, God, that guy, he, he was well before ahead of his time, wasn't he? He was, <laughs> yeah. he knew, he knew. Just hope this video doesn't last that long. Yeah, yeah. Um, who is your first celebrity crush? My first what? Celebrity crush. Celebrity crush. I thought it said liberty crush. I thought it was a liberty <laughs> crush. My first celebrity crush. Um, who, God, who would that be? Uh, Chitara out of the Thundercats when I was about six. Um, she's um, she's a, a, an animated cheetah woman, <laughs> I suppose. I suppose that's what she is. For, so probably her when I was about six. I went, she's nice, despite being two dimensional. Um, and then I don't know, I don't know who it, like I'm trying to think as I got, you know, as I hit those awkward teenage years, who would my, who would, I don't know, I can't really think, I can't think of who was, who was big at the time, who was, who was popular. Didn't have that long enough and an impression then. Nah, no one, no one left that, no one left the same impression as Chitara, the animated two-dimensional cheetah woman from the Thundercats. <laughs> so probably her. You guys are weird, like... Yeah, I mean, that, like, I hadn't thought of it until now, and then I realised I kind of wish I hadn't said it. <laughs> I kind of wish... Kind of almost wish instant yeah. 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 It was no thought. <laughs> yeah, who is it? Yeah, it's definitely... I'll well, just show you my Chitara posters, and then you can see... Who, um, yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, let's, let's go with that, and let's just gloss over it. <laughs> okay, so where's the strangest or funniest place you've ever woken up? The strangest thing I've ever woken up. Um, I don't know. I had a weird spell when I when I was a student um, of of uh, like kind of sleepwalking, and I would wake up and there was one there was a big cupboard thing that I'd wake up in the bottom of, and it was like a it was like, it's like some burrowing instinct kicked in during the night, and I would go and I would climb into little spaces, so I'd go by like I'd wake up like behind the couch in in the flat and would kind of go into. And then um, there was a, they say the big cupboard thing, and I'd be right down at the bottom, and it was like shelved in it, but then at the bottom shelf, and it'd be kind of just wake up under there, and I'd have no idea how I got there. Um, so that's probably the strangest <laughs> thing, just just little little mouse holes that I'd made for myself. I don't know what was going on at that point. <laughs> I don't do that. I don't do that now. I should stress. I don't. <laughs> so whatever whatever trauma had caused that has now been buried sufficiently deep that I don't, I no longer burrow in the <laughs> night. 
Yeah, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure my wife's relieved. <laughs> yeah. I'll wake up and find me under the you know, behind this curtain board. <laughs> um, if I was to ask your wife and those closest to you what your most annoying habits are, what would they say? Oh, my wife would give you a list. My <laughs> wife would have a list as long as her arm. Uh, probably just talking shit. Probably just because I, um, like, she's developed this thing over the years when um, I'll just start saying, you know, I'll start talking about something and I'll go in some weird flight of fancy and she'll just go, write it down. <laughs> she knows what I'm going, write it, just get it out that way, exercise that from your brain. Go and write it down and put it in. And like so many books have come from me, just, you know, just like, oh, imagine that happened. Um, and that, so, um, yeah, she'll probably put that, just that. And just that sort of, I suppose, inability to function as a, as a normal human being. <laughs> so, like, you know, it's that, like, don't forget to do that. And I'll go, yeah, definitely won't forget to do that. And then I'll start going, oh, imagine, you know, mice all wore hats or something. And, and I'll spend the rest of the day imagining mice wearing hats. And then she'll come <laughs> back and go, did you do that thing? And I'll go, absolutely not. You know, no, I, 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 what thing? I don't recall being asked about that thing. By the way, imagine mice wore hats. And she'll say, go and write that down and don't talk to me about it. So, so we've worked out quite, the relationship works quite well now that, that, that I ignore everything she says and she just ignores everything I say. So it's quite, it's quite good. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a healthy, normal marriage. That's yeah, like basically how, how most of them work, I think. Um, but yeah, so. But but, you know, taking all that, she's been, she's like, I mean, she's been, you know, from from my first book, she, we, were, we were kind of together then and everything. So she's been um, all the way through my kind of writing career. She's She's been a huge, you know, in all seriousness, she's been a, a huge kind of support and a huge, a huge help, um, which is not making me say that. But she still married you anyway, and she yeah. signed on the dotted line for better or worse. So yeah, she's, she's you, absolutely, you must have she's absolutely stuck with her, yeah. Somewhere, probably, yeah. My borrowing skills. <laughs> yeah. You'll have to ask her later, why are you still with me, Dad? She's yeah, don't that, yeah. No, don't, I don't want to make her think about it too much. If she's there, if she, if she goes, why am I still? It's that same thing. People go, like, how do you write a book? And I'm really worried that if I think too hard about how you write a book, I will go, I don't know. You know, like when you're breathing, you do that thing like, you know, when you go, when you breathe thing, right, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, and you kind of go, <laughs> and can you forget how to breathe. I'm worried that if I overthink, like writing a book, that's what's going to happen. Um, and I, I'm, I'm 99 percent sure if I said to my wife, why are you still in this relationship? <laughs> She'd go, I don't know. I don't know, and then just walk out. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not yeah. ask that question. Yeah, definitely don't. I don't well, want to. Well, I won't show this bit of the video. No, yeah, just skip over. Yeah. Um, well, you may be relieved to know I don't have any more questions for you, unless you think there's anything I haven't asked you. You want to tell us? Uh, I don't know. It's been pretty. It's been pretty probing. You know, we've gone from <laughs> we've gone from borrowing, sleeping in a burrow to fancy and chatter out of the Thundercats. I think that's. That's pretty much covered <laughs> off all the important stuff. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I don't know. No, I don't think anything else really. Um, the new, I think I, I said at the start. I think the new books out in nine days. The new, the new Logan book. So you can you can pre-order that now. It's called. Um, I can't remember what it's called. City of City of Scars. It's called. Oh it's called yes. City of That's Scars, it. and it's set in oh. Inverness, um, and. Uh, yeah, so that's out in nine days, and that was that was a, a fun one to write, and it's got yeah, there's there's things there's things happen in this book that that kind of change the future of the series forever. So if anyone doesn't know, um, where can they find out more about you, and where can they get your books from? Yeah, you can go if you go to jdkirk.com. Um, you will find everything on there, links to buy them. You can get uh, ebooks from Amazon, they're on Audible. My local bookshop, the Highland Bookshop in Fort William, does um, signed copies of them all. So you can order, and they usually have them uh, before anyone else. So the paperbacks are usually sent out, you know, a week or so before the, the ebooks available. So, and it will all be signed by my fair hand. Um, but yeah, just go to jdkirk.com. Well, thank you very much, it's been awesome. <laughs> thank you very much for having me.